What I'm going to be talking about, uh, well, either this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending upon where you're at, is the path, pathway to regulation. And I appreciate that for many people, as soon as you start talking about regulation, their, their eyes kind of glaze over and they're like, oh, no, but, but stay with me. And I hope to uh, provide some insights to this group for companies that want to start getting products with a kills or removes biofilm claim. So what is regulatory science? And really it's the development of tools that enable for informed decision making. So by training, I'm actually an engineer. Uh, my PhD is in engineering. But for quite a few years, what I've been doing is practicing regulatory science. And, and these tools can be actual tools, right? So I'll show you a slide that shows biofilm reactors. Michelle actually referenced one of them in her talk, uh, the CDC biofilm reactor. But tools can also be methods, uh, methods that utilize the reactors that describe the exact steps that someone needs to take to get the, the desired outcome. Tools can also be guidance documents. And, and so sometimes these guidance documents reference methods or reference actual biofilm reactors. But, but I would like you to take a broad perspective of this idea of tools. But the ultimate goal is that we get informed decision making on how to move forward with particular products. So the process that I'm going to go over, and uh, this is also the outline of my talk, is first you need to define the problem. Define the problem that you're trying to solve with an innovative solution. Develop and validate methods that address this problem. And then finally build consensus among not only industry, but also uh, the, the research scientists, the academics, and importantly, the regulators. So you can see this process here. You have methods, feeds into collaboration, and eventually you get guidance for informed decision making. So the first step is to define the problem. And what I am showing you here is a, a long draw draft system. So I am at the Center for Biofilm Engineering and I have predominantly studied in my lab uh, beverage dispense systems in relationship to food biofilms. Um, and so some of the questions that uh, we need to ask ourselves when we're trying to develop methods or tools to study particular environments are what is the system of interest? What surfaces are we most concerned about? And I really appreciated Michelle taking the time to define the complexity that exists for some of these surfaces. You have hard non-porous, you have some porous surfaces. For some of you, it may be a food surface itself. And then to address what the concern is. So are you interested in, is it a fouling problem? Is it food safety? Um, you know, in the case of beer, it's actually taste. And so there can be microorganisms that get in there that alter the flavor profile of the beer so that when the consumer goes and gets that, that first uh, draft and takes a sip, it doesn't quite taste with what they taste like what they were expecting. Um, and the bacteria that are doing that are not pathogenic, but uh, it results in an unfavorable experience, I should say. So the next step is to look at existing methods and method bodies. So food science obviously has been around since the beginning of time. In fermentation, I think you can, you can read in the Odyssey um, about fermented beverages. So this has been around for, for eons. And so look at what the existing methods are and see what can be modified and what can be added to to help 
really address the concern. And, I, and for us, from the Center for Biofilm Engineering, by the time people come to us, their concern is most likely going to be biofilms in their system. So what methods exist that we can modify or um, tweak to, to study biofilms in the system? The other thing that's important is to identify the regulatory body. So I appreciate that I'm talking about an EPA pathway or, or the pathway that we took to get uh, guidance with regards to kills biofilm label claims on, on products for hard surface disinfection. Um, for food contact surfaces, uh, particularly if it's the food itself, I would actually go through the US FDA or maybe the USDA. So it's important to understand what regulatory body you need to work with. And of course, that it depends upon the country that you're in uh, and the claims that you want to, to make. And those regulatory bodies have existing guidance. So it's crucial to be extremely familiar with that existing guidance to see circling back here how you can incorporate, or as we like to say in our in international biofilms group, bring biofilm into the conversation for these existing methods. So in the beginning, I said that uh, regulatory guidance or regulatory science is the development of tools. And we have actually developed, honest to God, biofilm tools. So this is the CDC biofilm reactor, and Michelle showed you a picture of the rod right here. Um, this is developed to grow biofilm under high fluid shear conditions. And each of these reactors were designed with a particular use and application in mind, and they can be modified to meet the needs of particular study questions. So, for instance, the drip flow biofilm reactor is uh, grows biofilm under low shear close to the air liquid interface. And in this case, uh, media drops in onto a slide and it flows over that slide and then goes to effluent. In this system, the drip flow biofilm reactor may be something to consider for the food industry. The CDC biofilm reactor is actually what the US EPA references in their guidance documents um, to evaluate biocides uh, for use against hard, non-porous surfaces and for a hospital level disinfection claim. You have microtiter plate based methods. What I'm showing you here is the MBEC method. Uh, microtiter plate based methods are widely used. Um, the annular reactor, which has been used a lot in drinking water systems. The rotating disc reactor, which was actually developed to model toilet bowl biofilms. A treatment flow cell that allows for imaging under real time with coupons from the CDC biofilm reactor or the rotating disc reactor. And this is a new reactor system called the Industrial Surfaces Biofilm Reactor. And it was originally designed to model biofilms and cooling towers. So I, I am from Montana, and uh, the Center for Biofilm Engineering is in Bozeman, Montana. And we are surrounded by Blue River Trout, uh, or Blue Ribbon Trout Rivers. And so people come from literally thousands of miles to fish the rivers around Bozeman. And I am showing you two, two rivers here. So my family spends, this is our, our major activity during the summer. And uh, this is the Yellowstone River. And this is about 45 minutes from my house. And this is the Madison River, which is also probably about 30 minutes from my house. And uh, this is our raft rhino. And if you ever meet me in person, I will tell you the story of how our raft got named rhino. But for now, my husband, who's fishing right here, assured me that the UK is full of some amazing fly fishermen. And so when someone is going to go fly fishing, they take a lot of time talking to perhaps river guides or going to the fly shops 
to understand how the river is running, to identify what hatch is on, and all of that information changes daily and definitely changes depending upon whether we're going to the Yellowstone or to the Madison. So that same level of preparation that someone would give to fly fishing is important when selecting which biofilm reactor to use. And when we think of methods actually, and this I've been talking about the tools and the growth step, right? This is actually only the first step in the process. So when we think of biofilm methods, there's actually four discrete steps. The first is to grow a relevant biofilm. And frankly, this is where most people spend a lot of time thinking about the system, thinking about the microorganisms and the media and the temperature and the humidity and all of that is critical and it is important. The next step though, is how are you going to treat that biofilm, that mature biofilm? And in this case, what I'm showing you is a method called the single tube method. Um, it's an ASTM method and, and this is what's part of the uh, EPA guidance documents. It's in the EPA guidance documents. But then we need to know how to sample that biofilm. And in this case, what I'm showing you uh, is a step that includes both vortexing and sonicating because we need to remove the biofilm from the surface and then disaggregate that biofilm into a homogeneous cell suspension. And finally, we need to consider uh, how we're going to analyze that, those biofilm bacteria or perhaps yeast or fungi. And I'm showing you here the viable plate count, but uh, Michelle did an awesome job showing you that there's other options as well, right? Maybe your system isn't laboratory, maybe it's an actual field system, and you wanna do some type of a molecular analysis to see what's there. So we have uh, been working, I've actually been working in standardized biofilm methods for uh, over 20 years at this point. And our first uh, standardized method, so these are all ASTM standard test methods, was the rotating disc reactor. It was a method based on uh, using the rotating disc reactor. Um, the CDC reactor method was, standardized, originally approved in 2007. Uh, we have one for the drip flow, the MBEC assay, the single tube method, and most recently I've submitted one on urinary catheters, although I appreciate for this audience that a, a urinary catheter method probably isn't where your interests lie. I have marked the ones with an asterisk that have undergone a ring trial. And what a ring trial, so that's a multi-laboratory study. And one of the components that's really important for standard methods development is uh, assessing the statistical attributes. And really this is what distinguishes a standard test method that can be used for regulatory decision-making apart from a, a great research method that allows an academic to say, get a, a good publication. And it's this assessment of the statistical attributes. So I am showing you Statman here. Um, Statman has had a couple of different names over the years. And our current Statman at the Center for Biofilm Engineering is Al Parker. And I work with Al in the Standardized Biofilm Methods Lab to assess repeatability. So that's when we're looking at the data. We need to know how the, the data varies within a single laboratory, and then a reproducibility. And this is an interlaboratory study. So this means that that method was performed exactly as written in multi-laboratories. We look at ruggedness, and ruggedness is actually something that's very traditionally done in engineering. Um, but it wasn't so common in microbiology. And so uh, it, it's very exciting. It, what it does is we take this SOP settings, right? So the, the standard operating procedures that are set, and then we vary them a little bit lower and a little bit higher. And we see how varying some of those settings impacts the mean uh, log density, which is the parameter of interest for us.
And this gives us just a tremendous amount of information about the method and how it's going to perform. If, for instance, I'm going to reference Michelle again, let's say humidity, right? So if that humidity changes by 10%, 20%, what is the uh, impact on the parameter of interest? And you can actually design a study that allows you to quantify that. It ends up in a linear regression that allows you to quantify that. Uh, responsiveness, this is sensitivity. And, and this is if I use my method and I test a, a product that has low efficacy versus high efficacy, the method should be able to um, detect that, right? Something that is effective versus something that's not effective. We also think about relevance, and this is, I've been talking about understanding your system and making sure you're modeling it well. And then how reasonable is it to run? So for instance, we have an amazing microscopy facility with a Raman microscope, but chances are most laboratories are not gonna have a Raman microscope. So it wouldn't be reasonable for us to include that in a method. So I'm just showing you uh, this ASTM method E2647. This is the drip flow reactor. And I wanna show you what the precision and bias statement looks like. And so the information you need to address bias, which is actually challenging in microbiology. Um, and I can talk about this more in another talk, <laughs> how to assess bias. But essentially what we came out with is our mean log density was 9.2 the repeatability standard deviation was about 0.23. This is all on the log scale per centimeter squared. Uh, the reproducibility standard deviation was 0.27. And for those of you who work in microbiology, actually those are phenomenally good. <laughs> um, and then we break down the sources of variability. And so we know that 28% of that variability was attributed to laboratory to laboratory variability. 31% was attributed to experiments conducted within a single lab, and 41% was attributed to channel. So this is really interesting. This information is what allows us to um, make an optimized experimental design when we're going forward to, to help the regulatory agencies come up with performance standards they need to know this information to, to be able to make those performance standards as to you know, how many combinations of the chemistry need to be tested and how many labs against how many coupons. This point right here also told us that um, controlling flow within these channels is really challenging. And so we realized that uh, people who invest in the drip flow reactor also need to invest in a very good pump to make sure that the flow is uh, as close as possible among the four channels. All right, so when we're thinking about regulatory science and regulatory guidance, there's essentially four different claims that companies maybe want to make. And the first is a reduces controls claim. This would be a low level of efficacy, maybe three logs. Um, and it's essentially controlling biofilm accumulation in the environment of interest. The second is a, a kills claim. This is a high level of efficacy. This is the claim that's currently in place in the US, uh, in the US EPA guidance. It's a six log kill, which is a lot um, and requires a fairly aggressive chemistry to maintain or to achieve that kill. Another option is a prevents bacterial biofilm. So for instance, people who are interested in um, who are interested in antimicrobial surfaces are often looking at prevention claims, uh, like for instance, prevents initial attachment. And then finally, you can have a removal claim. So biofilms are not just the bacteria, they're bacteria in the matrix. And for some applications, uh, like a drain, for instance, in a poultry processing plant, really what you wanna do probably is remove that bacterial biofilm from the drain. So I'm going to leave you with some points to ponder. Uh, the first one is kill does not equal removal. So you can very easily kill a biofilm, but not remove the biomass, 
and it is possible to remove the biomass but not kill the biofilm. This is, this is a mouthful. Reproducibility is a quadratic function of the log reduction. So this is really important when using the data to set performance standards. And here I have the mean log reduction. So that's the kill in viable cells. And here I have the reproducibility standard deviation. If I was doing an engineering method to measure the strength of a material, there would be one reproducibility standard deviation for that particular method. That is not the case for microbiology antimicrobial test methods. And I'm showing you biofilm methods, but uh, remember I said that there have been a couple of statments. So my original mentor was a man named Marty Hamilton, and he studied uh, antimicrobial test methods for, uh, we have like 30 years of data, and we see this time and time again. And that is this reproducibility standard deviation is an upside down, it's a frown, right? And so as uh, down here, when the mean log reduction is low, nothing is killed, then the reproducibility standard deviation is low because it pretty much reflects uh, what the reproducibility standard deviation of the control data is. And then this is for the MBAC. I'm gonna use the CDC reactor for the next example. So up here is a, a kill of greater than eight logs. That's, that's a lot. And you can see once again, that reproducibility standard deviation is low because everything's killed. It's pretty much a lot of zeros. But when you are in the middle, so this is intermediate kill. What you find is that this reproducibility standard deviation increases. So if you're for a method in the middle, like killing some of the cells, but not all the cells, that's where your reproducibility standard deviation is going to be the greatest. Another point to ponder is to consider what's left behind. So here is a Pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm, and it's grown uh, in the presence of hard water deposits. So these gray pieces are hard, hard water deposits, and you can see the Pseudomonas completely growing in and around those hard water deposits. The log density is 7.4. We applied a treatment and decreased the log density to 2.1. So that's a greater than, than five log reduction, right? So that's, that's pretty good. So then, but here's the rest of the story. What we like to do then is take that surface and put it back in sterile media and monitor regrowth. So within 24 hours, this biofilm had regrown to 4.8 logs. And this is incredibly useful information if you're trying to develop like a clean in place process. How long does it take until your biofilm recovers? All right, so, so I'm starting to wrap up here. So the collaboration, and I've been talking about this a lot, uh, to get methods and to get guidance for regulatory approval of products really requires collaboration. So it requires uh, academic researchers, input from industry, and working with our regulators. and we all come together really in the development of these standard methods. But not only do we need to have collaboration, we need to build consensus. So uh, a year ago, almost exactly, we have a meeting, we host a meeting at the CBE um, that's called Pathways to Product Development and it's held in Washington DC where we invite our regulators. And so these are the results. I showed these four images of Pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm um, grown on tubing, actually, and asked the audience to vote whether or not it was a biofilm. And you can see in this case, 71% said yes. And in this case, you can kind of see the, the cells right here, 83% said yes. Um, in this case, where they look like individual cells, they were pretty split, half said yes, half said no. And in this case, 67% um, said yes, 
but it looks a lot like individual cells, right? Kind of surface associated cells. So that's a big question. How do you distinguish surface associated cells from mature biofilm? And is that important for the regulatory guidance you want to have in place? And of course, it will be different for a medical question like a urinary catheter versus a food contact surface versus um, a cooling tower. All right. So while this pathway is winding, one thing to keep in mind is there's no need to start at the beginning. A lot of work has been done in this area and there's some solid methods that people can look at and maybe use and adapt for their own purposes. And so I appreciate that maybe sometimes you feel you're in an infinite loop here, but, but we can break out of it and eventually get down to these guidance documents. So the Center for Biofilm Engineering, uh, we have various areas that we, we study, biofilm control strategies, energy and the environment, health and medicine, industrial processes and systems, standardized methods and water systems. Um, I live along with my colleagues, uh, mostly in the industrial processes and standardized methods but I can put you in contact with other people if you have other areas of interest. And I just want to do a quick shout out for the Elsevier uh, Biofilm Journal. I'm a, a senior editor on this journal and we are openly, we are uh, accepting manuscripts. So if you are interested in publishing your research, uh, reach out to us. And then I'm going to leave you with a parting image of the Yellowstone River. Uh, looking back on Emigrant Peak. So Yellowstone National Park is kind of down here a little bit. Uh, and this was taken this fall. And I want to give a shout out to Kelly Gorham. He was a photographer. He's phenomenal. And then my colleagues at the Center for Biofilm Engineering. And so with that, I would be happen, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Darla. That yeah. was an incredible presentation. Um, if anything, it just tells us how important standardization is um, for advancing this field and being able to answer the question that was asked earlier in terms of what have the biofilm research community done for us. And um, to paraphrase Monty Python as John did earlier. Um, I'll go to Will and ask if there are any questions coming from the Q&A for Darla. Sure, so the, the first question is, um, given that your experience in having tests approved in, in the US, how would you suggest uh, similar parties in, in the UK and EU progress um, getting their tests approved? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that Mark and I have spent uh, many meetings discussing. And so I think the first, the first step really is identifying what regulatory body you want to work with and then understanding what methods exist and how you can um, either uh, adopt or modify those methods or develop your own methods so that there's a key defined procedure that people can use to answer the question like with regards to efficacy or with regards to removal or prevention. Um, and, and once that method is in place, then, then the conversation can begin with how do you make decisions around that method. Great, thank you. And then the second question um, comes from Mark. He asked how long the journey is to get a new test and standard approved. Just to give well, people an idea of how long this might take. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so starting from scratch or starting because, um, so we started working on the development of the CDC biofilm reactor in the early 2000s. Uh, and that's when we, we started to work on the standard method, doing all the statistics, getting it approved. Um, the interlaboratory study started in 2012, another one in 2015, guidance came out in 2017. So I don't want people to start to shudder when they, when they hear that timeline because a lot of work has already been done. So for instance, with the CDC reactor, the drip flow reactor, We've already done the collaborative study. So we know the statistical attributes. So, so
So you don't have to start from the beginning. And actually, biofilms are gaining in momentum and people are really understand the importance. We, we uh, have been talking with US regulators and I'm sure that Mark's talking with UK regulators and they're understanding the importance of biofilm. And so that education component, which is critical, hopefully we're further along in that process. So, so that we can say, okay, we know this is important. Now let's contemplate these two or three different methods and see which one would be the best for us.